at least twice a day. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this press conference, both here in the room from the 49th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos. And also welcome to everybody watching online and on social media. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. You're joining this press conference uh, under the title, The Humanitarian Crisis That Will Shape 2019. And um, we've already had yesterday and today, we heard a about a lot of economic crisis. And I think uh, we want to take this opportunity with our wonderful panel to take a closer look at the humanitarian uh, crisis. I'm joined uh, to my immediate left uh, by Heba Ali. She's the director of IRI News, or as you will soon learn, um, the new humanitarian, uh, as it's rebranding itself, uh, uh, rightfully so at the moment. Um, to her left, we're joined uh, by Peter Mauro, who's the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC. Um, right there in the heart and center of our panel, we're joined by David Miliband, who's the president of the International Rescue, Rescue Committee. And uh, last but definitely not least, we're joined today by Tara Nathan. She's the executive vice president for humanitarian and development of MasterCard. Thank you very much uh, for being here today. And uh, Heba, without further ado, let's, um, let's hear from you. You recently launched uh, with Irin an overview over the coming crisis that we have to brace ourselves for. So what are these key crises and trends to watch in 2019? Please. Absolutely, thanks, Georg. Uh, we every year run a list of, of crises on the horizon. We're a news organization that reports specifically about humanitarian crises. Um, and have a network of about 200 journalists around the world who do so. Um, I won't go through all 10 because that would take up the entire press conference. So I'll list um, just three of them. But if you want the full list, you can find it on our website, erinnews.org. Uh, for us, the big story of our beat remains fragile states. That likely won't be a surprise for many of you. But Syria, Yemen, South Sudan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo all feature on this year's list. And in each of those countries, there are rays of hope that um, in the year ahead there could be some improvement, but um, in all of those countries, no silver bullet solution and a lot of long-term humanitarian implications. So in Syria, the government is closing in on victory, but military victory will not solve the deeper political problems that are tearing the country apart, nor will it address the needs of some 12 million people who are displaced both inside and outside of the country. In Yemen, a national peace deal may be on the horizon, but uh, what we've been seeing is at the local level, there are a number of grievances that could lead to continued conflicts, even if um, a peace deal is successful nationally. In South Sudan, uh, there are um, hopes that the latest truce will hold, but we saw that in 2015, and um, that fell apart soon after being signed. In, in DRC, again, um, hopes for peaceful transfer of power for the first time have been tainted by disputed election results and allegations of fraud. Um, armed attacks are continuing in various parts of the country. You've got Ebola outbreaks, you've got severe food insecurity, all of which are intersecting for a very dangerous mix. mix. So um, we, we feel it very dangerous to take our eyes off any of these countries despite some of these recent signs of progress. And fragile states are becoming even more relevant now with new instability emerging in um, the Sahel, among other places. Last year, we embedded a journalist with a new separatist group gaining power in Cameroon. We've recently been reporting about um, the spread of the insurgency in, in Mali, in Burkina Faso. We're seeing rising militancy in Nigeria, in Somalia, and elsewhere. So the risk, of course, is that these emerging conflicts go on to become like the others on the list of major humanitarian crises. And uh, for us, the big question is whether the international community can develop a more effective way of dealing with fragile states. So that's number one. Number two is climate displacement. Until recently, climate change has often been talked about um, as a gradual threat of the future, something that affects polar bears and coral reefs. And what we're seeing in our reporting very clearly is that climate change is already dramatically affecting people's lives today. Um, our reporters have met migrants in Bangladesh who were displaced after watching their land disappear due to river erosion exacerbated by climate change. We've met villagers in the Pacific Islands who are warning that their entire communities are going to be wiped off the map as sea levels rise. We've met farmers in Somalia who have abandoned their farms and, and moved to the cities because of yet another bar bad harvest. Herders in Senegal who've been plunged into poverty because of unpredictable weather patterns threatening their way of life. 
Um, the World Bank, as many of you will know, predicts that climate change could force 143 million people to migrate by 2050, but we are finding plenty of people around the world today who are already facing the prospects of displacement as a result. So that's something we'll be certainly watching. And lastly, um, refugees returning prematurely. Across all of our reporting, there are millions of refugees being pressured to return home to countries that are in no way ready to receive them. Um, one example, a 35-year-old uh, woman in Afghanistan who, after two decades as a refugee in Pakistan, um, returned and found herself sitting on a, on a plastic chair at a UN reception center in a dusty border town with nowhere to go. Um, she was among almost one million Afghans who returned from Pakistan over the last three years. But they're coming home to a country that is mired in conflict, uh, where aid and jobs and reintegration support are in limited supply, and where the voluntary status of their return is questionable. Um, 2019 is shaping up to be quite a pivotal year for the, year's, the, the world's four largest refugee crises, Syria, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Myanmar. Um, and involuntary return to fragile regions could be a whole new crisis in the making. So I will leave it at that. Uh, thank you, Heba. Thank you very much. You mentioned climate change and you mentioned briefly the Sahel. Uh, Peter, you're just returning from Sahel. What's the picture you, you're seeing there and, and, and what maybe are signs of hope for you there? Maybe a, a couple of remarks from my side as well. First, uh, because humans uh, are used to calculate years, it's not that every year start a new set of priorities. I'm sometimes surprised to realize that since I'm president of ICRC, there is always the same regions which are regions of concerns because they are particularly fragile. One third of everything we are doing is happening in the Middle East, 42%. The second 42% or the first 42% is about uh, conflicts in Africa. And so these figures will remain the same most likely uh, in 2019 as they have been from 2012 to 2019. So there is an issue of fragility that Heba has uh, mentioned before which uh, continues to be of particular concern. I think uh, in a place like the Sahel what uh, struck me most and it might be emblematic for what we are seeing in many other places is that when you look at the history of conflictual relationships and violence in the Sahel you see that just the superposition of poverty, exclusion, discrimination, violence is now topped by scarcity of productive land because of changing rainfall patterns, which normally we draw back to climate change. And so it just jumps into your eyes that a particularly fragile and resource scarce region, I mean natural resource scarce region, is then particularly challenged because of climate change. And this again translates into scarce resources and conflict that have been traditional conflict and they have been there beforehand, particularly between agriculturalists and pastoralists in that region, suddenly get violent again because conflict regulation mechanisms are not any existing anymore, because the state is too weak to be a neutral mediator in a resource scarce environment. And so you have exacerbation of conflict because of climate change speaking, changing rainfall patterns. So it's just jumping into your eye that when certain regions of the world can adapt, mitigate climate change, others cannot and fall immediately below uh, the threshold of, uh, uh, of survivability for many, uh, for many people. Second issue which preoccupies us also from the insights in the Sahel, and again is not something which is limited to the Sahel, is really the transformation of violence. I think we see with dramatically fast pace Almost in each and every conflict, the conflagration of political violence, intercommunity violence, crime, and banditism. And I think this challenges humanitarian actors more than in many times before. We are not anymore confronted as a neutral outsider, confronted with a conflict, a political, military, strategic conflict between two sides or three or four sides. It's a mix of violence which challenges us, particularly in many conflicts. Uh, 
My third point on the hopeful uh, perspective. I mean, there is no question that in hyper-fragile contexts like the Sahel and many others, humanitarian actors need to substitute themselves to the non-existing social services of public policy actors. Having said that, I have been impressed by the resilience of people and by the populations and organizations in the Sahel being the first responders and engaging in productive activity even in the most adverse situations. And for me, this has been an illustration and a call to humanitarian actors to look much more closely on how we can support productive responses of communities, women's organization, youth organization, who go into income generating activities and despite all the difficulties, manage to get on with their lives and with a little bit more support from the international community, not in substitution of what they are doing, but in support for income generation activities, that uh, would change a lot and could change the dynamic. My last point, is just to draw the attention that we are here in Davos not least because we are convinced that there is a deal out there to make between the investor community and the humanitarian community. And I'm particularly happy tomorrow to be part of the launching of the high-level group on humanitarian investment because I truly believe that we need to partner up with the private sector, with, uh, uh, with the investing community, to find ways of scaling and speeding humanitarian response into particularly fragile contexts. Investors will not go there if humanitarians don't show a little bit of a way and humanitarians can't be there any longer in innovative ways if we don't get support for more than just state-driven uh, humanitarianism, which is necessary, but as such is limited, will be limited, and will be insufficient to cope with the dimensions of problems with which we are confronted. So these are a couple of issues of a big preoccupation to us, but also with a perspective that may be a kind of new type of dialogue brings actors of different kinds together with a more impactful response to some of the big issues that we are dealing with. Thank you, uh, thank you, Peter. David, let's hear from you how you see these trends and how these trends are impacting humanitarian crisis. And also maybe if you could, could follow up on, on what Peter said on how the private sector can play a role there, uh, please. Sure, uh, I'll be very brief to leave some time for uh, questions. Um, the International Rescue Committee is a global humanitarian agency helping people whose lives are shattered by conflict or disaster, so very much the fragile and conflict states that Heba and Peter have uh, spoken about. What we see is a growing number, a growing length, a growing complexity, and a growing severity of humanitarian crisis. That's what, uh, one symptom of that is the 68.5 million people who are now uh, refugees or internally uh, displaced. Uh, the internally displaced, uh, I think, are a significant and under-recognized category alongside the refugees. Countries like Northeast, countries like Nigeria, especially in the Northeast uh, of the country, are emblems of the kind of problems uh, that we are challenged by. Also, Yemen, which has not yet been uh, discussed in detail, uh, is a country now facing, according to the UN, uh, 14 million people at the risk of famine if the peace talks that Heba referred to uh, are not followed through. Uh, I'd like to just pick out uh, three uh, very dangerous uh, or, or significant trends, uh, if I may. Uh, the first is the rise of what I call the age of impunity. Uh, that is the idea that uh, belligerents in a conflict uh, are able to commit crimes and not be held accountable for it. Um, Yemen is often described as a tragedy, but in fact it's better described as a series of crimes. Um, second is a crisis of diplomacy. Uh, we're seeing a retreat by the major global uh, diplomatic players in a way that creates a vacuum that we uh, believe is a direct contributor to the rising levels of uh, violence and humanitarian tragedy that we see. Uh, the third is uh, an inertia of humanitarian aid reform, and we think that 2019 needs to be an, a, a year of significant reform. The truth is that the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, are not going to be met 
because of failure in fragile states. More than four out of five, 82 percent of uh, fragile states are falling behind on the SDG uh, commitments. And from our point of view, that is a clarion call, first of all, for more accountability through specific targets uh, for tackling the extreme poor. After all, there are more extreme poor today in Nigeria than there are in India. Uh, second is a change in financing. The kind of short-term drip-drip financing that is predominant in humanitarian settings is completely out of uh, kilter. Uh, with the nature of the needs and explains why uh, less than 2% of global humanitarian funding goes on education, even though most of these humanitarian crises run for 10 or 20 uh, years. Um, and uh, third is the uh, core agenda of reforming the way the humanitarian sector uh, works uh, on the theme of the so-called grand bargain that was achieved at the World Humanitarian Summit two years ago, but has been honored more in the breach uh, than in the observance. Uh, I'm here in uh, Davos because I th believe that a time when governments are in retreat, NGOs and the corporate sector have to step up, and that's what we're hoping to see this week. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, Tara, that's a wonderful bridge over to you. Um, David uh, made it clear that the private sector has to, has to step up. Now, it's a bit unfair because obviously at MasterCard you're doing a, a lot already. But let's hear from you wh what actually could be the role of the private sector um, in, in, this, uh, in this crisis. Sure. Thank you. I think I might even just reframe it from uh, a mandate or a calling on the private sector to step up and say that the private sector is stepping up and wants to play a critical role, which is a nuanced distinction. What we're finding is that our employees, uh, uh, that, the, that uh, the people who work for us are saying overwhelmingly that they want their companies, they want their CEOs st to stand for social change. Uh, there was a recent Edelman uh, uh, Trust poll that was released that talked about how 85% uh, of employees said that they relied more on their employers to be social agents of change uh, than their own governments, that they're looking for that role. Uh, I think we're seeing that. We're seeing that in our employee base, uh, not only in our ability to attract high quality talent, uh, but, but in our ability to sort of retain and to have that action. So when I speak about MasterCard, uh, I run a team. Um, we have uh, numerous arms within MasterCard that focus on um, philanthropic types of engagements. But what I think is really interesting is the team that I lead, which is, um, an effort to sit, figure out how we can leverage MasterCard core assets, capabilities, uh, uh, technological innovation um, in, in digital transaction services to apply them into humanitarian and development contexts. Um, we think that the private sector has a great role to play both in uh, preventing potentially the causes of humanitarian crises as well as post-humanitarian crisis in creating some of the uh, resilience mechanisms that sort of generate local market activity. Uh, what does the private sector do in spades? We, we create employment. Uh, we look for you know, giving access to education, um, access to markets, um, uh, access to health care. And these are the types of things that we at MasterCard are, are, have been doing and increasingly uh, look to do more of. Um, we have partnerships with, um, or with a lot of the traditional sector players. Uh, we have a partnership with the IRC um, where we are looking to create digital tools as an example around how can we make the delivery of healthcare or the delivery of vaccines more effective uh, and more traceable. Uh, we have platforms that we're building to enable smallholder farmers to gain access to uh, vibrant local markets. So how do you give them access to large scale agri-buyers so that they have more agency and they have more power to um, extract economic rents from, from the produce that they make? Um, and the examples can go on and on. And we're just one company. Uh, and that's the role that we can play. But we think that by this example, that there is a, a broader role um, for, like I said, for private sector to play uh, in creating um, these vibrant local markets. Thank you, Tara. And you, you're one of 1,600 global business leaders here in Davos. If you look at your 1,599 fellow business leaders here in Davos, do you have the sense that this message is, is reaching the community? Or do you feel you're, you're, you're fighting a lonely fight for these causes? Like I said, I think it's not us fighting, uh, it's not us fighting against the community. I think I, along with the other 1,599 leaders, are hearing the same message from their employee bases. Uh, and that is that 
um, companies increasingly, I think you're going to see, are going to have um, a social mandate. I think uh, there was a, uh, an S&P study that said that of the S&P 500 companies out there in 2011, only sub-20% had uh, a CSR report, an ESG report published. In 2017, it's 85% plus. Um, and what I'm saying is, I don't think that's because we're being dragged. I think it's because our employees are pushing us um, to, to, to get out of, in front of these issues. No matter what the issue is, whether it's humanitarian, whether it's development, whether it's local market context, whether it's sustainable supply chains, whether it's um, uh, you know, access to education, whether it's data integrity, all these issues are things that, um, that the employees and the communities are, are, are pushing us forward on. Thank you very much. Um, let's see if we have some questions from the floor. Um, we have a microphone. If you could uh, say your name and organization, please, for the sake also of our online audience, please. Thank you. Hello, James Bays from Al Jazeera. Um, if I could ask the panelists about Syria and how they see things in Syria with regard to the humanitarian situation in the area where the U.S. is pulling out and where it was saying it was providing some sort of umbrella for some humanitarian activity, uh, worries about northern Syria, Turkey and the Kurds, what preparations uh, are being made by um, the two agencies that are represented on the panel uh, in those two places, and what was mentioned before, um, returning refugees, whether there is pressure on some to return now to Syria and their view on, on the circumstances on the ground. So thank you very much. The humanitarian situation in Syria and the returning refugee question. David. So uh, we're obviously very concerned that the northwest of the country becomes a killing zone. Uh, Idlib is now host to about three and a half million people, the province of Idlib. Uh, that includes about one, one and a quarter million internally displaced uh, who have uh, either been chased or moved voluntarily from other parts uh, of the country. And we were very fearful in the run-up to the October 15th agreement uh, that there would be um, a full frontal attack uh, on that on those people uh, with consequences directly for them and then for a knock-on for greater refugee flows. In the Northeast, um, we obviously don't comment or recommend military maneuvers, but we do say that whenever conflict players do make military decisions, they have to take into account the humanitarian consequences. And there's no evidence that the US decision to withdraw its 2,000 troops has had any uh, dimension of humanitarian concern built into the policy making uh, process. And obviously, that's a source of great concern for us. Uh, we do see in um, some of the surrounding uh, countries pressure for refugee return. And uh, all of our evidence from the refugees themselves is that they don't consider Syria yet to be safe. They also see various signals from the Assad regime that the regime doesn't want them to uh, return. And that speaks to the need for continued uh, focus on support for countries like Lebanon and Jordan. Uh, Peter Maurer rightly referred to the need for consistency in humanitarian policymaking. Uh, there's a danger that the uh, situation in Jordan and Lebanon becomes yesterday's issue. And we think it's incredibly important that the international system supports in a far more effective way the governments and people of those two countries in ensuring that refugees are able to stay until it is genuinely safe to go back. Can I just uh, add that what uh, David mentioned in his introduction, a lack of diplomacy is uh, particularly visible in the case of Syria, where, uh, of course, the international community is obviously split on the future political uh, deal with regard to Syria, and this inhibits also humanitarian actors uh, to come big scale uh, into working in Syria and uh, bridge that famous gap everybody is talking about, short-term humanitarianism and more long-term uh, resilience and development aid, which would be badly necessary given the massive destruction that the country has seen and displacement that the country has seen over the last uh, couple of years. So I think uh, we will be able to scale and speed uh, humanitarian work in Syria only in a sustainable way if there is some other political deal than the present political deal uh, in Syria. I would just add that we've um it, it almost happened by accident. We, we 
have been reporting about counterterrorism legislations and the implications for NGOs in Syria, and one story led to another, led to another, and it has become, the legislation, it, leg, legislation itself has not, in most cases, gotten worse, but the um, application of it has, and it has caught many NGOs up and made it a lot harder to deliver aid in Syria in particular, and that's something we can expect to get worse next year because there are a number of investigations um, by the U.S. government that are likely to, to reveal um, even uh, more kind of stringent uh, rules moving forward. Thank you very much. Um, we might have time for one last quick question. Yeah, the lady in the center there, the microphone is on its way. Thank you. A uh, question for David. Sophie Edwards from DevEx. Uh, in the face of Brexit and considering UK's leading role as a humanitarian actor, is there a danger that we could see the UK stepping back its leadership role? And would you have a message maybe for the government on that? Um, I have many messages uh, uh, <laughs> Brexit related, but not all of them are completely focused on the subject of this uh, press conference. Um, look, the UK, I th I'm really proud that um, across both parties in government over the last uh, decade, there's been a very strong commitment to international development and also uh, to international policy reform. I think the Department for International Development has been a really good policy reformer uh, as well as a funder of international efforts. Uh, I believe, actually, that there is cross-party consensus for that global, quote-unquote, global Britain role to continue uh, after Brexit, but there's an obvious arena where Britain's influence will be lost, and that's within European development and humanitarian policy. Uh, when we first came into government in 1997, uh, European Union development policy was at a very nascent stage, which is a diplomatic way of saying it wasn't very good. And over the last 20 years, um, the European Union has become a really leading player, not just in the amount of funds, but in the quality of funding that it gives in development and humanitarian context. ECHO is an outstanding uh, humanitarian player uh, these days, and that's not all thanks to Britain, but Britain has played its part in the renewal and renovation of European development and humanitarian policy. And that voice will obviously be lost. Now, I think there's enough momentum in the European system, but it's obviously one of the tragedies of Brexit is that Britain's role uh, is diminished. What I very much hope is that if Brexit does indeed go ahead, that the government negotiates a way for it to continue to partner with European institutions uh, after Brexit so that uh, the forces of Britain and uh, continental partners are at least combined in this vital area. Thank you very much. And mindful of the time, I'm closing the press conference here. Thank you very much uh, to all my panelists today, and thank you very much for being here, and thank you for watching.